Have you ever heard something on the news that left you scratching your head? Did you even follow up later and find out that what you heard was entirely false? Our biases cause us to eat up and share misinformation like it's nobody's business. Today we're going to learn how to fight media bias and how to save the truth. Later in the episode, we'll hear from Eduardo Nuret, who travels between college campuses and exposes media deception. My name is Tiffany Roberts from the Leadership Institute, and you're listening to the Lead Your Future podcast. Do you want to fight liberal bias on your campus? Have you or your friends witnessed it at school? If so, Campus Reform wants to hear from you. Campus Reform is dedicated to fighting liberal bias on college campuses. You can help Campus Reform in their mission by sending incidents of liberal bias their way. To do this, all you have to do is go to campusreform.org tip. Hey guys, welcome to the Lead Your Future podcast. If you're enjoying these episodes and this podcast, please click the subscribe button and feel free to leave a five-star rating wherever you get your podcasts. Also, follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Leadership Institute and on Twitter at Leadership I-N-S-T. Do you have a topic that you're just dying to hear me talk about? Feel free to shoot me an email at troberts at leadershipinstitute.org and I'd be happy to make that happen. Now on to today's episode. The mind-blowing madness of misinformation. It's hard to know who's telling the truth these days. Almost as difficult as it is important. A CNET survey found that 60% of adults posted news stories they later discovered were completely false. I know my parents are part of that statistic. And you know, how many stories have you shared through your life that you never realized were completely misleading or just misled? A Stanford research study from 2019 found that 96% of students didn't consider the special interest of the sources they share studies from. If we don't know who's paying for our news or what they want us to believe, we can be easily manipulated. The truth is undoubtedly under threat. All we need to do is to apply the acronym SAVE, Source, Analysis, Variety, and Explanation. First up, we have Source. The first step is the most difficult, but also arguably the most important. Every media source has a bias of some sort. In fact, it's actually their responsibility to reach their audience through the right lens. This doesn't mean that all media is lying to you, but it's important to correct for this. The first step is saving the truth is to understand the source. Who are they trying to reach? How is it going to impact the data they share? Do they have a history of letting different interests influence their information? And most importantly, where do they get their money from? It's important to remember that bias does not invalidate a source of information, but it is important to consider when you're absorbing the news, especially on social media. Next up, we have analysis. We see graphs on the news. Commentators, they throw numbers at us constantly, but how often do these studies actually mean what they say? When graphs show relative change, they can often start at a number other than zero. This is deliberately deceptive, but very easy to detect if you look for it. Also, studies often take place with very small sample sizes. When you hear an impactful or important statistic before changing your mind about something, check the source. It's often fairly easy to find the source on a news site, and if you can't find it, that's a red flag all on its own. Once you find the source, take a quick look at the study itself and determine for yourself whether or not it's sound. You really don't have to be an expert to smell when something's fishy. The two most important questions to ask when it comes to data analysis are how the study was done and whether the data actually says what it claims to say. Next up in our acronym SAVE, we have VARIETY. Pew Research in 2019 found that nearly half of Americans get their news from only one or two sources. When you start varying your sources on a given issue, you're already better off than half the country. Headline apps or headlines themselves are a good way to do this. Just go on all of the major platforms you can find and read the headlines in a quick summary. When a title grabs you, read on. There are countless apps where you can get the five minute rundown of the news and what different sources are saying about it. A fantastic tool is the hourly news app for Apple and Android, where you can get three to five minute summaries of all major events and headlines for that day from each of several sources. 
Varying your news sources may sound intimidating, but it doesn't have to be difficult or even complicated as long as you do it right. Now, last in our acronym save, we have explanation. American investor Charles Munger is famously quoted saying, I never allow myself to have an opinion on anything that I don't know the other side's argument better than they do. Harvard Business Review found that voicing our thoughts changes how we think about them and forces us to explore them a little more deeply. A Psychology Today article from 2014 explains how understanding opposing viewpoints not only makes us smarter, but is the only way to get a full understanding of a given issue. If you can articulate their view better than they can, that's when you're ready to state your side in a way that even a political opponent can be willing to hear it. Now that you know some ways to avoid misinformation and falling into the trap of echo chambers, bias, and herd thinking, in just less than a minute, we'll hear from Eduardo Noret, who regularly interacts with all three daily on college campuses. On the horizon, do you see it? That's the digital future coming towards us. Whether you fear it or embrace it, there's no escaping it. But LI can help you prepare to take hold of it and make it your own. Whether it's creation, analytics, communication, or strategy, the Leadership Institute can equip you for the road ahead. Go to leadershipinstitute.org forward slash training and click digital. Again, that's leadershipinstitute.org forward slash training and click digital. The only difference between being left behind and leading the way is being ready. And welcome back, everybody. I'm now here with Eduardo Neret. Eduardo, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me on. So could you just kind of give everybody a quick rundown of what you do at uh, Campus Reform and how you guys are connected to the Leadership Institute? Yeah, so I'm a digital reporter over at Campus Reform. We're one of the many projects of the Leadership Institute. And so my role there, which, you know, coincidentally has been a little tough during the coronavirus pandemic, is to go out and film man on the street videos, go on college campuses, talk to students and talk to them about, you know, things that are in current events, things that everyone is talking about right now during the news cycle. So that's my primary role. You know, I create those videos. I also encourage our correspondents and I try to get them prepared to go film videos of their own on their own campuses. Uh, and then I also touch on some of our other digital content. You know, if something's up on the YouTube channel, I probably had a role in doing that. Uh, and then, you know, everyone who's listening may know Cabot Phillips, who is our editor in chief, you know, the main spokesperson, if you will, for the outlet. I occasionally do that as well. Sometimes, sometimes I'll go on air to talk about some of the videos I've made, talk about some of our stories on the news site and, and help contribute to the reporting we do on liberal bias and abuse. So that's my role at Campus Reform. And uh, uh, we've been working as hard as ever during the pandemic to kind of uncover what's been going on in these campuses, even though they are shut down. Oh, I'm sure it's definitely not easy. But I'm actually I'm curious, how did you get involved with all of this, all of this in the first place? Like what brought you to Campus Reform and what really motivates you to, you know, get up every day and do what you do and, you know, go to college campuses, interview students? What what's the passion behind that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, several years ago, I was a student at the University of Florida and I've always loved media. I've always loved conservative media. Um, you know, that conservative media has played a huge role in kind of uncovering, you know, media bias and things of that nature. And so. Um, several years ago, we brought Ben Shapiro to our campus and actually a, a Leadership Institute uh, field rep for the Florida area was helping organize that. And so, you know, I wasn't super involved with any of the conservative clubs on my campus at the time. They were fairly new, but I went out with them to to flyer for Ben Shapiro and we sort of talked about, uh, you know, if we see anyone tearing down our flyers, if you guys have any issues, be sure to record it, be sure to film it, which is something that the Leadership Institute, you know, I've learned, tell students to do. We want to uncover and, and get this bias shown on camera. So I was out doing that. I was putting up flyers and I saw this student tearing them down. So I quickly took out my phone. I confronted the student. I said, what are you doing? Why are you tearing down our flyers? Um, and that ended up sort of get going, you know, slightly viral. It was covered on the Daily Wire, Ben Shapiro's website. And uh, Hannah Weeks, who was the Leadership Institute uh, Florida field rep at the time, encouraged me to send that over to Campus Reform so they could write a story on it. And so that was my my first connection with Campus Reform. And then after that, uh, in a similar way to what we do with students right now is, you know, someone reached out to me. They said, hey, we think you'd be a great campus correspondent to report on what's happening at the University of Florida, what's happening in the rest of the state with regards to higher education abuse. So I got involved there, wrote as a student. Um, through the rest of my years in college, it was it was a great opportunity, a great gig, and I never really thought campus reform would be somewhere I ended up right when I graduated. Uh, I graduated um, 
you know, at the time, and I remember reaching out to a number of conservative outlets, even at the time, campus reform, I, I don't recall them hiring. And so it's a pretty funny way, uh, the, the way things work out, I guess. I, I had started a new job um, coming out of school and a few weeks into the job, uh, Lawrence Jones, who was campus reform's former editor in chief, gave me a call and he said, hey, you know, what are, what are you doing right now? I know you kind of told me you were on the job hunt. We actually have an open an opening at campus reform for for someone to film videos, someone to go out on campuses and talk to students and things like that. And, you know, I was aware of, of um, you know, Cabot doing that at campus reform. And, um, you know, I, I had sort of, you know, liked the man on the street thing, you know, whether it's watching Jesse Waters on Fox News, he used to do that. Um, I was close personal friends with Will Witt at the time, and he had started doing that at, at PragerU. So I thought, well, this, this could be a really interesting way where I could continue at campus reform, do something a little bit different than what I had done when I was a student. And it, it seemed like a new opportunity, an interesting opportunity, which it obviously turned out to be. And I'm so glad I I, uh, I had joined campus reform this time about a year ago. So um, in terms of, I think the other part of your question, just what motivates me each day to get up and do what I do, I think now more than ever is I love bringing college students, stories on college campuses, higher education. I love bringing those topics to the forefront of the news cycle. I think, you know, rightfully so, maybe in, in, in many eyes, these stories have taken a backseat this year with the coronavirus, with the economy, with the election being, you know, considered more important issues. But I, I like every opportunity I can to bring, again, the college students and, and you know, college and university life in general back into in, into the news cycle, because in many ways, college campuses are a microcosm of the rest of society. So seeing what college students think, asking them what they think, what they know, seeing what their opinions are, is a reflection of what the next generation is going to be like. It is a reflection of what the next two years, three years will be like possibly down the road. And so if we ignore that, we're ignoring, I think, the tides of the way the country's turning. You know, as an example, some of the stuff we saw this summer, um, you know, tearing down these statues, going after our founding fathers, that was new to a lot of people because I don't think they had seen how widespread it was on college campuses. But the reality is this has been uh, happening on college campuses for three or four years, and we've been on that story. And so, you know, many times, you know, if, if we can show a story, show how it's evolving, show what college students are doing, I think more times than not, you look at that and you look maybe six months, a year, two years down the line, and what was happening on a campus is then spilling over into the rest of society. So that's what I enjoy doing. That's why I enjoy doing it, because I think it's an important topic, an important aspect that I, I, I think people don't want to miss and they shouldn't want to miss. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. And I think it, it's kind of it's kind of sad how it works. It's usually it's usually too late until people realize like, oh, wow, like there's actually an issue on college campuses, because by that time they're hearing about it. It's already a giant issue. Like right now, it's all over Fox, all over CNN, it's all over these major outlets. Yeah. And that's that's an issue. But luckily, campus reform is there to expose that earlier and show people what what's really happening. Well, and something, too, about what we do at campus reform, which I don't think, um, you know, gets enough credit all the time is is our desire and our willingness to have a conversation with these students and change their minds. So it's it's no secret that a majority of college students in this country lean left and are liberal. You know, the polling shows that our videos show that our stories show that. But I think something that's really re rewarding to me out in the field, even if it might not be the most viral video or it might not be the most viral response I get, is when I talk to a student and they tell me, you know, I didn't know that. I, I hadn't heard that before or I hadn't heard uh, Trump accomplished this or, you know, I didn't know, um, you know, X, Y, Z. And so I've been getting that a lot recently, especially, you know, when it comes to the coronavirus topics, when it comes to President Trump's record, you know, we've had several videos go viral recently where we present President Trump's record to students. We tell them it's Joe Biden's or we tell them it's Kamala Harris's and the students say, oh, I love that. That sounds so great. And then at the end of the video, we say, well, actually, this is something Trump did or this is something Trump said. What do you think about that? And so I've been I've been getting a lot of responses where these students say, you know what, I haven't always been the biggest fan of President Trump or I'm not personally a conservative or I'm kind of an independent and I thought I used to think this way. But honestly, thanks to what you've told me, I'm going to give it some more thought. I'm going to do some more research. And so that's that's something very rewarding that I think all of us have experienced at Campus Reform. And that is ultimately the end goal. You know, we're trying to expose liberal bias and abuse on campus. And the hope is that that exposure, uh, exposing it, you know, shedding some sunlight on it will change some minds. Exactly. So what do you think is the biggest problem on college campuses? Is it the misinformation? Is, is it people being told not to like Trump just because everybody else doesn't like Trump? What is the biggest problem on college campuses? 
It's a lot of those things. It's all of those things. Um, you know, obviously, I think the first thing that comes to people's mind is the administrations and the professors. They're uh, so extremely biased. You know, you look at the studies. We covered one earlier this year where uh, college professors donated to Democrats from a ratio of 95 to 1. So, you know, when you have that influence on a college campus, when these are the people teaching our students, um, you know what side of the argument you're going to get. And, and when that's inundated, when they don't even get a glimpse of the opposite side, it's very easy for them. It's the lazy thing to do to to say, well, if my professor is saying something, it must be true. Or if my friends are saying something, that must be true. And I think another aspect of it is the culture. You know, I, I college is a fun time for a lot of people, but I think students get wrapped up in their own little worlds, their friend groups, you know, what they're doing. And so they don't really pay attention as to what's going on in the real world. You know, the news, I encourage people to, uh, especially students to, to read current events, to do their own research. And, and that's what we see uh, not happening on campuses. We see a lot of students, the ones I talk to, a lot of times I get responses like, well, my friends say, or, you know, I, someone told me the other day in a video, you know, my opinion of President Trump is based on what my friends have told me. And I, so I think there's a laziness there. I think, yeah, I, th I think if all of your friends and your friend group uh, believe a certain thing, it's a lot easier for you to believe. It's a lot harder for you actually to take the time and do your research yourself. Um, and so when you look at that, when you look at the combination of what I said before, just the professors, the administration, the academics there, um, it's really hard to get the con conservative viewpoint. And even worse than that is when the conservative viewpoint is presented, it's shut down. So, you know, we've seen a couple of professors uh, during the coronavirus, sadly, doing these Zoom classes who have been canceled. Uh, you know, there was a professor who who said, you know, Wuhan virus in, at Syracuse University, and, and they, they basically prevented him from teaching. He's no longer teaching that course this semester. There was a professor at the height of the George F Floyd protest, um, an engineering class in, at, in, in California, and, um, you know, the students there demanded special grading. Um, for black students, just given what had happened, given some of the Black Lives Matter protests. And the professor said no, which is a very reasonable thing. I mean, no, you're in a college class. I expect everyone to do the same. I, you know, call me crazy, but I'm, I'm going to treat students equally. I'm not going to take their race into account of the grading. And he got backlash for that too. He got canceled. So each time, you know, a logical conservative or rational viewpoint is presented, it is attacked. And that doesn't help either. Um, you know, when I was a student at the University of Florida, just simple things like, putting a banner up on campus in defense of President Trump, doing tabling, doing activism, things like that would get you attacked. It would get your uh, things stolen from campus. You know, there was a, a campus reform correspondent who last fall, um, you know, was tabling and he had an all lives matter sign. And so he got attacked and assaulted as well. So it doesn't help. You know, one thing is to have the professors and the administrations be so far left. Um, and then when you can't even pre present the other side, when they shut you down for doing that, um, that makes it even worse. So it, it's literally almost impossible to get a conservative viewpoint on campus unless you're looking it up yourself, unless you're doing your own research. So when you're out in the field, what what are kind of the best practices for going out and changing someone's mind? Because because everybody it just seems like groupthink on these college campuses. How how do you actually go about it? Even, you know, tricking them to think it's not Trump and it's somebody else's, but it actually is Trump. What, what do you usually do to change somebody's mind? Yeah, I have to go out there with a good attitude. You know, obviously, sometimes what plays well on YouTube and what will help us get, you know, media coverage is kind of these videos where you own the libs or, you know, own the the ignorant college student, which it, it's, it's important, I think, to do that every once in a while, because you do have to challenge some of their crazy notions. You know, I, I did a video last fall when the Trump administration killed uh, Qasem Soleimani, the Iranian general who is considered one of the world's worst terrorists. And so I went on a campus and I asked students about that. And they were saying, you know, the fact that Trump killed him was a bad thing. Killing is wrong. You know, they, they lamented the fact that we killed this terrorist. And th so in those situations, I do have to push back. I have to be a little tough and say, you know, do you know how ridiculous uh, you sound? You know, you know how ridiculous this is that you're defending this. So you, you have to do a little bit of that every once in a while. But I think more generally, more broadly, um, you do have to kind of try to get at the students level. You have to try to see where I have to try to see where they're coming from if I want them to see where I'm coming from. And so uh, it's been hard wearing a mask in these videos. But before what I used to do is I, I you know, you try to smile, you try to laugh it off with the students. Um, a lot of times it's making small talk before I even start rolling the camera, showing them that I'm a nice person. I'm not tried there to expose them. You know, I just want to hear their honest opinion and I'll present another side. And so I find when you do that, um, when there's cordial conversation, when there's a nice back and forth before I start filming, the student is a, lot, is a lot more receptive to what I have to say. If I go in there very combative from the get-go or very obviously biased from the beginning of the conversation, uh, they're, they're not only less likely to uh, see my side at the end of it, but 
they're also less likely to even talk to me. So, you know, there, that, there has been a few times in the beginning where I think I was, I was getting the hang of filming these videos and I would go out very pointedly, very uh, opinionated to some of these students and they would then become afraid to share their own opinions because of, of they could see where I was coming from. So I think, I think it's, it's a level of understanding, certainly even if, you know, uh, campus liberals aren't so understanding of the very own conservatives on their campus. I think you do have to approach it with a certain level of openness uh, in hopes that maybe they will see a little bit of where I'm coming from. Now, have you ever followed up with these students and um, later on find out that they are, you know, completely changed? You know, they're on the the better side. They're they're all sudden conservatives. Have you ever had experiences like that? Um, you know, I've never you know, received a message or bumped into a student like that. Again, I, I think that would be great if I ever did. And it's not to say that it hasn't happened, but there have been a couple instances where um, I had some really deep conversations with some students after the fact where um, I, and I think, you know, I, I know I already said it, but sort of back to those examples about President Trump's record, I, I have had some students when the filming is done say, you know what, I, I really didn't know that. I'm going to look it up to see if it's true. And if you're telling me that, I, I do have to say I would look at Trump more favorably or I would look at this issue more favorably. And so I think that's the best you can hope for. Um, I would love to kind of see if there was a way to find the people that have interviewed before and see if their minds had changed at all. Um, I can't I can't say that all of them will have as as persuasive as I'd like to think I am. But um, but no, I mean, when I when I do get that feedback, when I do hear that, I think it's it's great. And I think I, I really hope that they do leave our conversations and do do their own research and, and look it up and whatnot. And so what advice do you have for students that, you know, you, you mentioned that student that just said like, oh, I believe this because my friends believe this. What, what advice do you have for students who want to learn more and they want to do that research? You know, what type of news sources should they be using? Should they stop using Twitter? What advice do you have for them? Oh my God. Yeah. I absolutely do not use Twitter for your news. Um, as an example, I, I was doing a video on the post office a few weeks ago. Um, and there's been this conspiracy theory floating around online and on some cable news outlets that Trump is picking up post office boxes and he's, he's removing the blue boxes from your neighborhood. So you can't vote by mail. And a student told me that. And I, I said, really, where'd you hear that? And she said, I saw that on Twitter <laughs> and I kind of gave her a look and, and then she followed up and she said, maybe I shouldn't get my news there. And I said, yeah, maybe you shouldn't in, in a joking way. And so that's number one. I mean, you're right on there. And then the other part of it, I do think it's a bit hard. I, I think it's a bit hard, you know, when you're all of your friends on campus think a certain way and you're starting to think the other way. I would say, you know, if your friends can't accept you for the political views you have, maybe they're not your friends. Um, I get that college students can be very, um, you know, difficult in in trying to accept someone who, who thinks differently from them. Maybe it's something they should learn. But I would say, you know, where should you go? You know, what, what attitude should you take? Um, I would go to whatever in your mind you thought of was was something you totally disagreed with before and give it a chance. So if you're a college student and you've always had a negative view of Fox News or or Ben Shapiro, and, and I say Ben Shapiro because, you know, usually when I talk to students, there was a student yesterday who approached me on a campus and he said, hey, I, I've seen your videos. And I, I was talking to him. I said, so where'd you get your political awakening? I mean, did you know, did this happen for you in college? And he said, yeah, I started becoming conservative about a year ago and I watched Ben Shapiro videos. And that's, that's something I hear a lot. A lot of younger people say he's the one who kind of lets them open their eyes to this. Um, and so that's, that's what I would recommend. I mean, whoever they've had a certain bias against in the past, whether it's Fox news, any conservative news outlet, maybe a politician, maybe even Trump, I would start there and, and do as much research as you can. You know, if you do hate Fox or if you've, if you've thought that Fox was this super biased place in the fact, turn it on, you know, for a few hours a day. Um, see if you really disagree with what they're saying. I do that occasionally. I'll turn on CNN. I'll turn on MSNBC because I like to hear what the other side is saying. Um, and so I think that's a good start for students. Um, but I, I see the challenge there. I think there is a challenge with students who are starting to open up to different viewpoints. I think there is a real fear in wanting to share their other viewpoints. I think there's a real fear in wanting to have a conversation with their peers because not only do they just get, uh, you know, labeled as as a conservative and, and they get shut down, but now we're seeing such extremes on college campuses these days where, you know, you're being labeled a racist, you're being labeled a sexist, you're being labeled all these isms and all these ists that uh, it's very challenging for someone to want to take that viewpoint. So I guess general advice, I would say go to other news sources, try to read both sides and develop your opinions. Um, be an independent thinker. That's a really cheesy thing I think we hear a lot, but um, you know, if everyone is thinking a certain way and telling you to think that way, at least that's always in my nature to have been 
you know, I, I usually take a step back and say, well, why is everyone telling me to think like this? Uh, sometimes it's about being a contrarian just to, to see what it's about, just to oppose, just to, to kind of give it some thought. And so um, I would definitely tell college students if there's an issue out there that everyone is telling them to have to have a certain view on, if their professors, their friends are telling them you must think this way, I would encourage them to take a step back to really think about the issue at hand, regardless of what other people are saying and ask yourself, do you believe in it or not? Um, do your own research and arrive at your own conclusions, arrive at your own uh, answers you know, with your information, with your thoughts, don't let other people influence you. Exactly. And now you got your start in college and uh, I've had a similar experiences um, as you um, on my own college campus, having experiences of, you know, being an activist and having people fight back and having, we even had articles written about me on campus reform, which is awesome. Um, and I didn't even know I was going to work with campus reform later on, but you got your start in college and um, I'm here now at Leadership Institute where do where do students go if they want to be that, you know, commentator, they want to be that person who gets in front of the camera, they want to be that person who writes those articles about those experiences they're having on campus? Where do they go? What resources are out there? How do they get involved with campus reform? That's a great question, because that's that's something that I always wanted to do when I was a student. And sometimes the answer wasn't so clear, you know, where do I go to do this? And, and number one, like you said, I think campus reform is really the only uh, conservative outlet, right leaning outlet out there that um, provides young people, provides students these types of opportunities. You know, there are a lot of outlets out there that will give internships, that will do things like that, but there's no outlet that really all of our reporting is is really based off the students. It's really, they play an essential role in what we do each day. And, you know, we have over a hundred correspondents right now for the year. And if we didn't have them, we'd lose a lot of stories. We would not have the pipeline of information coming through. And, and I'm, I'm proud to say, and I think everyone on our team would be proud to say that, you know, our outlet does let students speak for themselves. So if you write a great story, uh, if you make a great video for campus reform and you're a student, and it's something that goes viral, it's, it's something that you know, another news outlet, whether Newsmax or Fox News or Fox Business, whatever, if, if it's something that they're interested in, we're proud to put our students on so they can talk about their reporting and we train them. Um, outside of that, I would say a lot of feedback and advice I've gotten over the years from different people is, is to just, you know, in, in the age of social media with Instagram, YouTube, anyone can go viral. Um, and I think the challenge is I, I tried to do this in college. Um, you know, I, I sort of started a podcast. I started a web show. And something I learned from it is two things. Number one, never be afraid to ask for an interview. Um, the go-getters, the people who are, who are unashamed of, of going up to someone, no matter how famous they are and asking for an interview, you will get rewarded. So I, I had the opportunity to interview people like Ben Shapiro, like Kaylee McEnany, um, you know, Ann Coulter, all of these people in college, just because I, I reached out. I, I, looked, I looked up their emails. I messaged them on social media, um, people like Dave Rubin, stuff like that. And, and a lot of these people in the conservative movement who have these platforms, they're very understanding of who their fan base is. They know that they're supported by a lot of younger people and students. And so I think if you tell them, hey, you know, I have this show, I, I really want to interview you. I, I think it, it'd be a great opportunity, something like that. I think more often than not, you'll find that many of them are willing. And then number two is, uh, I think, differentiating yourself. So if you want to go into commentary, um, and I think it's understanding the difference between commentary and, and reporting, right? You know, if you want to be a, a news-based person and someone who's reporting the facts, that's a different route that, you know, I can't speak to as much. But in terms of going on air to give commentary, I would say you want to differentiate yourself on social media with your brand and think about the fact how many other students out there, how many other, you know, 18, 19, 20-year-olds out there are probably posting things on Twitter, making their own videos on YouTube and Instagram, sharing their conservative opinions. And when you think about it, it's probably a lot. So you have to ask yourself, what can I do differently? Or, or what about my own personal experience, my own personal upbringing, upbringing um, can be different? You know, sure, you can go viral just sharing mainstream conservative thoughts, and a lot of people have. But I think it's a lot more difficult. I think everyone's doing it. You have to give people a reason to say, uh, you know, why am I going to listen to Tiffany? Why am I going to watch Tiffany's podcast? Why am I going to listen to uh, Eduardo? W what does Eduardo have to say that is different from what everyone else his age is saying? And so if you can answer that as a student, um, and if you can provide that interesting content, that is interesting angle that nobody else is talking about, nobody else had thought of before, I think that's going to get you traction. And so as a younger person, you have to find a way to do that if you want to get into commentary, because uh, as much as I love it, the unfortunate truth is there are hundreds, if not thousands of people uh, in our industry who 
who do similar things, they want to do similar things. And, and we all have the same set of core ideas at the end of the day. So you have to find a different way to present it. Yeah. Thank you so much, Eduardo. That's all the time I have uh, for today. But I appreciate your willingness to not only create viral, viral videos, but also to change people's mind, because that's what that's honestly what's so important. And will you know, win us the next election. Thank you so much for having me. One last thing I want to say is any student out there, whether you think you're, you're born to be a journalist, a reporter, a commentator or not campus reform will train you the Leadership Institute will train you. Um, we've, we've taught people like myself who I, I had no journalism background, I, I did not study journalism. And, and we We've turned them into people who are capable of reporting on some of the most important stories on our campuses. So if this is something that in the least interests you a little bit, you know, you know where to find us, Campus Reform uh, and the Leadership Institute. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Lead Your Future podcast. If you like this episode, please subscribe, share or leave a five star rating on iTunes, Spotify, Overcast or wherever you get your podcasts. It is the Leadership Institute's mission to increase the number and effectiveness of conservative activists and leaders in the public policy process. That's why I bring you on-camera TV trainings, public speaking workshops, debate workshops, speech writing workshops, and so many more. If you're interested in taking one of these trainings, feel free to check out our website at leadershipinstitute.org forward slash training. The Lead Your Future podcast is produced and edited by Tiffany Roberts with support from Jared Cummings. Advertisements by Alexander Chang and Christopher Olson. Executive produced by David Fetter and Morton Blackwell. If you want to learn more about the Leadership Institute and see behind-the-scenes photos, follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and subscribe to Leadership Institute on YouTube.